All right, subscribers, welcome back to another episode of Science with Serbeck. Today, what we're going to be talking about is section 17.1, which deals with the electric charge and force. So this is our introduction into electricity. And before we get into the details of these notes, I just want to outline a couple of objectives that you should be able to meet by the end of this video. Objective number one, be able to identify the different kinds of electric charge. Objective number two, determine how materials become charged when they are rubbed together. And objective number three, determine the force that is responsible for most everyday forces. All right, so let's get go ahead and get into our definition here of what an electric charge is. So it's simply defined as an electrical property of matter that creates electric and magnetic forces and in interactions. Now, within our electric charges, there's some different types. One of the types is an electric charge with a negative charge. And we represent that negative charge with a minus symbol. Now, another type of electric charge is one with a positive charge. And then our third type of charge is an object with no net charge. That is, there is an equal positive and negative charge in that particular object. Now what we also have to be aware about with electric charge is the conservation of charge. And what that states is that electric charge is never created or destroyed. Now this conservation of charge is a fundamental law of nature. Now we can tie all of this information, this in introduction information about electrical charge into one example here. And we've probably all experienced that. And that is this. You get shocked after walking across a rug and touching a door or a metal doorknob. And so the reason that you get shocked when you walk across the carpet there and then you go touch that metal object or metal door is that as you move across the rug, an electric charge spreads throughout your body. Now, when you touch that metal object, the electric charge that is now throughout your body is going to pass through your finger and transfer that electric charge. So again, just emphasizing this, we have that electric charge built up from the friction of you walking across that rug. And then as you get shocked when you touch that doorknob, it transfers that electric charge. So we are abiding by that law of conservation of charge. Now what we need to talk about is the different types of charges specifically relating to negative and positive charges and going one step further. Okay, so we're gonna break this into two different categories. Number one is like charges, and then a little bit later on, we're gonna talk about opposite charges. So like charges are going to have the same kind of charge. And so what we mean by the same kind of charge is either two positives or two negative charges. And I use the positive plus symbol and the negative minus symbol to represent my positive and negative charges. Now, when two of the same charges come into contact with each other, they're going to repel each other when this happens or when they come into contact. So a good example of like charges is when you charge a balloon by rubbing it on your hair and you bring it to another balloon that has also been charged by rubbing on your hair. All right, so we can actually see this happen uh, with our simulation. So I'm gonna bring out two balloons and I don't have a whole lot of hair here. Uh, so I'm gonna use this fake rabbit fur and I'm going to bring out one balloon. Now I'm just gonna charge it up. This is simulating rubbing that head uh, uh, or your hair on a balloon. And 
I'm gonna get it all charged up like we have here. And I'm gonna bring over another balloon, this yellow balloon. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna charge it all up by rubbing this rabbit fur on the balloon. So both of these balloons are all charged up. And as this happens, let me see if I can get a hold of this. I bring the balloons close together. What happens here is they begin to repel one another. So as you can see here, I am not touching the other balloon. My other hand is free. And so I'm just gently bringing those balloons close to one another. And you can see the movement that we have here. And so what happens uh, in this scenario is that the balloons are repelling each other. So I'll pause the video and, and write that down. But the balloons are repelling each other. Now, when we have two opposite charges, we have to keep in mind this. Those charges are going to be different. And so when we have two different charges, we're either going to have, or we will have one positive charge and one negative charge. And again, I represented positive and negative via these symbols. So plus and minus or positive and negative charges. Now what happens here when we have two opposite charges is that they're going to be attracted to each other when they come in contact. And so an example of this is charging a balloon, once again by rubbing it on your hair, or in my case the rabbit fur, and then bringing it close to somebody or yourself, if you have long hair, and bring that close to that long hair. All right, so to show this example here of opposite charges, I still have my balloon, and like I said, I don't have much hair, so I am going to use the rabbit fur to charge the balloon up. And then to simulate our hair, what I have here is just some uh, ribbons, multicolor ribbons that can represent some hair. So I'll charge up the balloon here, again, by just rubbing it uh, with the rabbit fur. And all this is doing is it's inducing a charge onto the balloon. And we'll get it nice and uh, charged up here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the same uh, simulated hair and check that out. These, these hair particles, you can see they start to get attracted to that charged balloon. And as I rotate it around here, you can see that the different ribbons are essentially sticking or attracting to that balloon. So let's write that down. So that balloon and the hair were attracted to one another. Now what we can do here, we can go into a little bit of details of why this was happening. So I said, like charges repel and opposite charges uh, attract, but why is that? And we can really get into the structure of each and everything that we have here. So we start out here with what everything is made of. And that is everything, all matter, is made of atoms. And atoms are made up of three parts. The first part is a proton, which is positively charged. The other part is a neutron, which has no charge. And then the third part that atoms are made up of is an electron, which has a negative charge. So again, protons are positively charged, neutrons have no charge, and electrons have a negative charge. Now, something to keep in mind is that most objects, most objects that we come in contact with on a daily basis are going to be made up of an enormous amount of atoms. This means that most objects have a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And what that means for us is we're going to have a lot of charges that get transferred back and forth between one object and another. Now, what happens here if we have an imbalance of protons and electrons in a certain object? So if we have this imbalance, we get a net electrical a charge when we have this imbalance of protons to electrons. 
Now, if we have this net electrical charge, we can determine the electric charge. And that is determined by the difference between the protons and the electrons. A negative charge is going to occur when there's more electrons than protons in an object. And a positive charge occurs when there's more protons than electrons in an object. Now, I'm running out of room here, but there's still a concept and some things I want to talk about when I have the topic of electric charge and some atomic particles uh, being discussed. So I'm going to grab another sheet of paper and continue this discussion here. So the other concept that I want to discuss here is this concept known as the Coulomb. And Coulomb is spelled as such. Now, the Coulomb is the international system of units for electric charge. And a Coulomb has an electric charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th as its value. Now, depending if we're talking about a proton or an electron, we'll determine what the sign is of our Coulomb. So for a proton, this electric charge, one proton, is going to have a positive value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulombs. So again, one proton, the positive stuff, has a positive value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Again, that C is going to stand for coulomb. Now, an electron is going to have the same value, but it's going to have a charge that is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Again, electron is negative. It still has the same value in terms of the electric charge and this C does stand for coulombs. The only difference here is whether it's positive or negative. Proton positive, electron negative. Now, we need to talk about the value of the net electric charge. So let's give an example here. Let's say we have an object with a charge of negative 1.0 coulombs. So if something has a negative one coulomb as its electric charge, it's going to contain 6.18 times 10 to the 18th excess electrons. Now, this object that we have the example of would have a net electrical charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative uh, coulomb, or excuse me, it would have a relation to what one coulomb is. So how we can tie all this stuff together is in the following calculation. So if we have a charge of negative 1.0 coulombs and an amount of an excess of electrons of 6.18 times 10 to the 18th excess electrons, we can tie all this together. And the way we do this is by taking the negative charge of one coulomb. So I'm going to take the uh, negative charge of one coulomb from one electron. And I am going to multiply this by, I'm going to multiply it by the amount of excess electrons. And if I plug this into my calculator, again, I would have a negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th times 6.18 times 10 to the 18th, and I press enter, I get a value here of, if I round, to negative one. And that's how I was able to get my value here. Okay, so all of these things can be interrelated together in what we have up top here. 
Whoop, and I made a mistake here. This should have an excess of 6.25, 6.25 times 10 to the 18th. I was looking on my, my wrong chart here. And so if we do that, if we do that, just to show you that this does equal exactly one, I'm just gonna go back in here and I'm gonna have 6.25 times 10 to the 18th and then 1.6, 1.6, a negative 1.6, and this equals that negative one. Okay, so that's where we get our values there. Now, what we can do, we can move on to, okay, what is the point of this atom structure? So we know things are made of, of protons, neutrons, electrons. How does that help us with determining electric charge? And ultimately, the transfer of the electric charge. So electrons are in the outermost energy level uh, or electrons that are in the outermost energy level of an atom can easily be removed from one atom to another or transferred from one atom to another. Okay, so let me give you a picture here of what we're talking. I'm gonna use the Bohr model of the atom, which in the center, we call this the nucleus it has our protons and neutrons. Then in these outer shells, what I'm going to do to represent the electrons is I'm just going to draw a minus sign here, okay? And then something in the outermost energy level here would be an electron right here. So an electron here, this minus symbol, is in the outermost energy level of this particular example. And this is what we're talking about. These electrons or these negative charges can be removed or transferred from one atom to another. Now, these electrons in the energy uh, inner energy level do not normally move from one atom to another. And we should also note that the protons and neutrons are also in a relatively fixed position within the nucleus of the atom, and they are very rarely uh, transferred like we talk about with electrons. Okay, so just to identify a few things here. This stuff in the center where the protons and neutrons are located, that is what we call the nucleus of the atom, and out here in parentheses, I'm just gonna put contains the positive and the negative, or excuse me, the neutral parts, the neutrons of our atom. So they contain the positive and the neutrons. And then over here, this first ring that we have, this is known as the inner energy level. And along the outside here, the very far ring, this is the outer, outer energy level, okay? So that is our basic structure of our atom. Now what's really important for us is these electrons in the outermost energy level. So these electrons in the outermost energy level can be transferred from one material to the other when different materials are rubbed together. Now, we have to remember that depending upon the material will determine the directions in which the electrons are transferred to. Now, a really important point here, the reason that we're concerned about this transfer of electrons is depending upon how electrons are transferred, this is going to determine the flow of electric charge. And I started this here uh, for a very important reason here. This is the whole concept of electricity. When we're looking at it from a physics perspective or a science perspective, we want to know how the electrons are flowing because we want to know the direction or flow of that electric charge. That's a really key concept here that we're trying to obtain in the physics concept or topic of electricity. So 
We can now move on a few more definitions here that we need to go over for this section. So our first definition here that we need to go over is an electric conductor. And this is defined as a material in which charges can move freely. Now, I wanna add a little bit something to this here. I say charges can move freely in these conductor conductors, but most of the time we're talking about the movement of electrons. So I'm gonna put here mostly or most of the time we're talking about electrons. And remember, electrons are going to have that negative charge, okay? Now, an example of this would be a copper in power quartz. Now, an electric insulator is defined as a material in which charges cannot move freely. And some examples of insulators would be things like cardboard, glass, silk, or plastic. All right, so let's put a real world, word, real world meaning to insulators and conductors here. So we have the uh, electric toaster cord here, all right? So I just have a cord, and what I want you to notice here, and you could notice about most of your cords that you have in your house, is this. If we look on the outside, there is a plastic portion that is on the outside of this cord. So this plastic on the cord here acts as an insulator to our power cord. And that plastic part of the cord prevents charges from moving through it. Now, if we were to cut this cord open, and I'm not going to do that, but the inside of the cord would have a piece of copper running throughout the whole cord. And so the, uh, this thin copper is very important. So one, this thin copper cord acts as a conductor. And the copper is going to allow charge or charges to move through it. And so it's really important in electricity to identify insulators and conductors because something as simple as this power cord is doing a couple things. One, it's allowing the charges in that electrical cord to move throughout that conducting center, which is composed of the copper wire but the plastic that coats the outside prevents those charging from leaving the power cord and ultimately or, or possibly causing a shock. So it's these simple things of insulators and conductors that make our, our business of electricity safer for us as people who use electricity every day to utilize on a safer note. Okay, now what we're going to do, we're gonna go through another term here known as an induced charge. So an induced charge is defined as a charge in which protons, the positive ones, and electrons, the negative charges, are distributed at opposite ends of an object. And so an example here is redistributing the charges in a neutral conductor. All right, so to show this, I have another example here. I have a pith ball, which has a neutral charge. It's really a styrofoam ball here. And then I have this rubber rod. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to redistribute the charge on the rubber rod by charging it up with this rabbit fur again. And then as I get it charged up, maybe you can hear the static electricity going back and forth. I am going to take this charge rod and you can see that the pith ball, it's moved off the screen here, but I did not touch the pith ball, but it moves, it moves as I bring this now charged rubber rod. 
So let's explain what happened to our rubber rod and pith ball example here. And again, I'm not touching it. I'm just redistributing those charges, okay? So what happens here is this. One, as the negative charge of the rubber rod, which is what we did as we charged it up with the rabbit fur, as it is brought close to that pith ball, the electrons in the pith ball are repelled and moved away. So what happens as a result is that part of the pith ball that is closest to that rubber rod, it causes the pith ball to be positively charged. Now, the other part of the pith ball, the one furthest away from the rubber rod, is going to become negatively charged. Okay, so now we can move to how we can charge objects. And there's, there's two main ways that we can simply charge our objects. So our first method to charge objects is through contact. And now this is going to occur when objects are charged by touching or a charged object uh, or uh, a, excuse me, it occurs when objects are charged by touching a charged object to a neutral object. And an example of this would be when a negatively charged rubber rod touches a neutral object. When this happens, some of the electrons move from the rod to the neutral object. And because we had this transfer of electrons, that object that the rubber rod touched now has a net negative charge. And the rubber rod is now going to have a smaller negative charge because it's transferred some of that negative charge to that object. Now we can also charge objects by friction, and this is going to occur when one material gains electron and becomes negatively charged by sliding across another material. And an example of this is when you slide across the seat of a car, hopefully not with leather seats, uh, but a car uh, that causes electrons to be transferred from your clothes to the seat of your, um, from the seat to your clothes. So what happens here are the electrons are transferred from your clothes to the seat or from the seat to your clothes. This causes the seat to become negatively charged. And it causes your clothes to become positively charged. Okay, so this allows us to go into another term and concept uh, known as static electricity. And static electricity is just stationary electric char charge <clears throat> caused by friction. Now, static charges are going to remain in an object until it is removed by the following. One, it can be removed by electric current. Or two, it can be a, a removed by electric discharge. Now another concept that we need to talk about here with static electricity is the concept of static discharge. And this is going to occur when the excess charge flows from or to the surroundings. Now this flow of charges creates that spark that we see when we commonly think of static electricity and getting shocked. That is that, that light, you can actually see it if it's dark enough, that is that spark that is created by that static discharge. Okay, so we can move on yet to another term and, and definition here, and that is of polarization. Now, polarization is going to occur when atoms or molecules in, of an insulator produce an induced charge on the surface of the insulator. Now, this is going to happen in a molecule that is polar or 
one molecule that has a partial positive and negative charge. Now, a great example of this is water. So what I have here uh, to show you this example is a basic setup here. And this right here, if I uh, change the camera here, this right here is just a burette and it is full of water. And so what I am going to do is this. I'm just gonna show you here that the flow of water here as we let it go out the burette can go straight down. Now, what I am going to do, I'm gonna raise this up just a little bit here so you see just the uh, tip here of the burette. I'm gonna take a balloon and what I'm going to do here is I am going to, I am going to just charge that up with that rabbit fur that we have been utilizing. So again, I'm gonna get this balloon all nice and charged up and I am going to let this water, I'm gonna let this water flow from the burette. So initially here, you see here that it is a straight line and now as I bring, as I bring the balloon closer, check out the movement of that water. Now, I'm going to, again, charge this again, charge the balloon, and then pay attention to the stream of water. So again, I'm just charging up the balloon with the fake rabbit fur and the balloon, and check this out, all right? So I'm gonna let the water flow. As I bring that closer, check out the flow of water. Now I'm not touching the water, we're just inducing a charge on this polar molecule. And you can see here, as I do that, it comes in and out, and I never touch the water with the balloon. It's all from these charges, okay? So I am going to pause the video and clean this up and we can get back to notes talking about the specifics here. So, when a charged object, the balloon in this case, is brought near water, the positions of the electrons within the water molecules change slightly. Now, this change of position within the water molecule causes the water molecule to be slightly more positive or negative than the other side of that water molecule. Now, this slight change in position of electrons and the partial charges of water causes it to respond easily to charged objects. And that responding to charged objects is what we saw as the bending or the appearance the water was bending towards the balloon, all because there was this induced charge and there was a partial uh, charges on that water. That allowed that whole water to be bent towards that side of the balloon. Okay, so now we can talk about here electric force. We've introduced a lot <coughs> of topics here. So the electric force is <coughs> the electric force is defined as the force of attraction or repulsion on a charged particle that is due to an electric field. Simply put, this is the pushes or pulls between charges. Now, the electric force at the atomic and molecular levels is responsible for most of the everyday, everyday forces that we observe. Now let's go over some examples of electric force. So one example is the bonding of atoms and molecules. This electric force is a portion of what holds atoms and molecules together. Another example is the force that is felt between magnets. That pushing and pulling that you feel is a, a direct result from those electric force, those plus and minus charges that are contained within the magnet. Okay, so now we can talk about, okay, we have this electric force. 
how do we know how strong that electric force is? And so the electric force between two objects is going to depend on two things. The first thing that it is dependent upon is the amount of charge in each object. This amount of charge is proportional to the product of the charges of each object. Now, this is sometimes a little bit easier to see in a mathematical representation. So our formula here, if you want to think of it like this, the formula for the amount of charge would be the electric electric force is equal is equal to the number of charges on object 1 so number charges on object number 1 times times the number of charges on object number two. Okay, all right, so what we can think about here, if we have this mathematical formula here, the amount, the amount of the charge on an object, if it doubles, the electric force doubles, as long as we don't factor in that distance.
Again, the electric field explains how electric force does not require objects to touch. Now, this electric force is due to the electric field associated with the first charged particle. Now, to help explain this, we have what we know as electric field lengths. All right, so electric field lines are going to show an electric field. And how they're going to show it is through arrows in which they point, the arrows of the electric field lines are going to point to the direction of travel of the electric force on a positive charge. So to help represent this here, electric field lines around a positive charge are going to point outward. So if we had a positive charge here, the electric field lines would point outward. And that's because these electric field lines are showing the travel of the positive charge. Now, just on the reverse side, if we show the electric field, line, field lines around a negative charge, they're going to point inward. So if we were to draw that picture here we would have the negative charge and the field lines because they're representing the positive charge here would be pointing towards would be pointing towards this particular object okay so now we can tie this together and piece this together through some examples so let's say we have field lines near two positive charges so again, what we have going on is this. Our two positive charges, let's say they're near each other. The field lines, the field lines would look as follows. Again, this is the direction of the positive charge. And so one, these two, these two uh positive charges would be repelling and that's shown by the field lines. Now notice here that there's space in between these two positive charges and that is showing it is repelling. So two things, one, the field lines point away from each other and two, the charges are repelling each other. Now let's reverse course here and let's talk about field lines near two opposite charges. So let's say we have our positive charge on our left here and our negative charge on our right. So remember the field lines are going to show the travel of the positive charge. So what would be happening here is this. These positive charge field lines would be pointed towards the negative charge particle or negatively charged piece. Now, the uh, field lines of the positive particle are still gonna be pointing outward. The difference here is now we have this attraction via the field lines that we can actually see and represent. So, something to keep in mind here only half of the electric field lines that leave the positive charge end at the negative charge. And I forgot one important, important thing here. This positive charge right here, this is supposed to be twice or two positive charges. That plays a key role into that statement I just made. So again, two positives, one negative, and only half of the field lines that leave the positive charge end at the negative charge. Okay, so what we have or why that happens is because the positive charge is twice as big as the negative charge in this example. Again, this is specific to our example. All right, I know this has been quite the uh, lengthy set of notes here, uh, but we've introduced the concepts and the items associated with electricity. We can step a little bit more into detail and into depth in our next couple of sections over electricity. Hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe.